kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat lin nas you are the best of people evolved for mankind for humanity this humanity orientation is one of the fundamental aspects that should be shaping our awareness our sensitivity because the quran very clearly lays out this uh, understanding that we are not just for ourselves we are not a self-centered ummah we are actually created or evolved for mankind and this theme of humanity orientation is probably so important that in the last surah of quran so many times the word annas is mentioned uh, and uh, as you remember that it reminds us all of us that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is rabbun nas he is ilahin nas he is malikin nas and basically the very last word of the quran is annas humanity so this value premise is going to be one of the uh, guiding principles underlying my thought and of course in this presentation as well the second of the two premises that i want to underscore here is fairness in my humble estimation it is the most central islamic value uh, that we should be aware of and focus on in surah an nisa it mentions that uh, verse number 135 ya ayyuhal ladina amanu kunu kawamina bil qist shuhada lillah walau ala anfusikum and that's the part i want to just underscore that all you who believe stand out firmly for justice as witnesses to god even as against your self uh, there is some background uh, noise probably some microphones should be muted uh, anyway uh, in this regard fairness virtually in all ideology in all religion uh, it is uh, 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 emphasized but there is something very unique in this message that we should note that in regard to standing for fairness allah is asking us not just to stand firm but actually even as against yourselves even as against ourselves so people should not be just seeking justice people should not be just thinking about justice but even when the judgment or verdict goes against them rather proactively we should always be thinking that whatever we are doing whatever we are um, acting upon whatever decisions we are taking uh, policies that we are having input into are we actually being fair this proactive consciousness about uh, being fair is something very unique and i hope that we all would take note of that and think that how it should influence or shape our thinking and attitude that brings us to something that i want to offer as a key resource about my perspective and approach some of you who may have uh, known me or just getting acquainted through this webinar well this book would help you understand that how my thought process has evolved and many of the ideas that i would like to share with you is actually informed by this key resource it's a book that came out in 2011 published by triple it uh, in virginia toward our reformation from legalism to value oriented islamic law and jurisprudence and just like in the previous two slides i talk about the two value premises it is actually arising out of the value orientation that is articulated in this book and throughout this presentation as i share my summary ideas there will be additional resources that i will be pointing out hopefully some of you would read that or explore and also share your feedback inshallah for our mutual enlightenment and improvement but before proceeding further i want to share a special statistic i am not going to show the screen here but many of you might be familiar with a site called worldometer it basically provides global statistics and country wide statistics on various issues i just want to touch uh, on one of those statistics 
And this is actually the number of people who died of hunger today. And as I see uh, the statistic now, it is showing that today, based on an average, that 19,507 people have died out of all the people who have died today just because of hunger or lack of food. Now, uh, that should make us think that in our presentation that we'll be having here in webinar, there will be a number of people who would be dying every minute due to hunger. And this is something as human being, as Muslim, we should take note of and think about why is that and what can I do, we do in this regard to prevent it or address it. I will return to this special statistic at the end of this presentation as to what does the statistic uh, stand at uh, maybe an hour later or so on. And at that time, we'll have an idea that uh, how the statistics changed over this one hour period of time. Moving on, Islamic finance and Islamic law are interwoven. However, in our modern time, Islamic finance seems to be more law than finance. And this has not escaped the attention of others. At Harvard, uh, activities of Islamic finance is not hosted by Harvard Business School. It is hosted by Harvard Law School. The same thing is also at University of California, Berkeley, that Islamic finance activities there is also hosted by Berkeley Law School. And also much of the things that we discuss sometimes as Islamic financial engineering are more legal structuring than financial engineering. That is why understanding Islamic law in terms of its nature and orientation as we have received over the past centuries is indispensable. As far as Islam and law in general is concerned, uh, one of the statements from Imam Ibn Qayyim, I think is highly relevant, where he said that Sharia is based on wisdom and achieving people's welfare in this life and the afterlife. Sharia is all about justice, mercy, wisdom, and good. In a similar line, uh, a more contemporary author, Dr. Jasser Auda, in his book, Maqasid al-Sharia as Philosophy of Islamic Law, has articulated that I understand Islamic law to be a drive for a just, productive, developed, humane, spiritual, clean, cohesive, friendly, and highly democratic society. However, throughout my travels in various countries, I see little evidence for these values on the ground in Muslim societies and communities everywhere. That's why understanding Islamic finance and achievement of the Makasid require understanding of Islamic law as has been accumulated over time, because sometimes there could be a disconnect between what has accumulated and what is actually needed. As far as Islamic finance is concerned, there are advocates and there are detractors, and there are some fair and there are some unfair criticism. The industry has scored a remarkable uh, development and growth during the past four or five decades. However, uh, some of the criticisms against this is stated as that uh, it's uh, Islamic merely in label. It is mimicking the conventional finance. It emphasizes form over substance. It's not linked to the real economy and it is serving primarily the well-to-do in the society. Some of these criticisms, in my view, are not fair, but some of these are. So a distinction must be made as to what is fair and what is unfair, and our evaluation should be that much uh, objective and uh, uh, bias-free in this regard. But regardless of this criticism, what needs to be noted is that the achievement of the industry from the starting point of being prohibition driven is undeniable. And this is already drawing attention globally. There is hardly any country or any community that does not know about Islamic finance. And it has spread far and wide 
even though it may not be in every country, but it has uh, spread rather widely, uh, primarily, of course, in the Muslim majority countries, and then also in many other uh, regions, including in Europe. However, it needs to be noted that Islamic finance is also in some way handicapped because it is not embedded in a broader Islamic economy. And it has to struggle and survive without a full-fledged and supportive Islamic financial system. What we have right now, uh, from regulatory to macroeconomic perspective, Islamic finance is currently limited to the product and institutional level. And often existing and operating in a dual financial system and thus not getting the full backing of a financial system and economic policies that actually are uh, synergistic to Islamic finance. So that constraint must be kept in mind before uh, we make any uh, criticism, some of which might not be fair in this regard. Also in this regard, I would recommend uh, two readings. One of those is Contemporary Islamic Economic Thought, written by me in 2013. Another is coming out uh, in a couple of months, inshallah, uh, Islamic Finance Eclipsing Islamic Economics, Causes and Consequences. And uh, in this, you will find an analysis of me in regard to how Islamic finance now is the dominant theme and not about Islamic economics or Islamic economy. So now we can begin uh, that next wave that I had uh, uh, mentioned about. One of the things that I would like to see is that we should be moving from legalism to value orientation. And let me briefly explain what do I mean by that. In every society, there needs to be law, otherwise it would be a jungle. But law and legalism is not the same thing. And that is why after Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Islamic law or fiqh developed, but it gradually took a legalistic bent where greater emphasis is on form than over substance. And also as Islamic finance emerged in the 20th century, the second half of the 20th century, by that time, Islamic legal discourse had already been victim of legalism for many centuries. And by the way, the book I referred to earlier is basically focused on how legalism has uh, dominated the Islamic legal discourse. So uh, that book is a good resource for this purpose. And this legalism impacted Islamic finance by shaping it as a prohibition driven uh, enterprise, uh, as Islam actually teaches us that there are certain prohibitions and we must stay away from those. But this focus on avoiding prohibition uh, has been without due or parallel focus on achieving makasib, Islamic values, principles, and norms. So a shift in this regard from legalism to value orientation would imply engaging finance uh, to achieve positive socioeconomic goals and pursuits. So if we want to assess Islamic finance about its relevance and performance, it would not be whether ROE is comparable to the conventional finance or better. It's not the size or the growth rate, but it would be actually uh, assessed in terms of what is it contributing toward the socioeconomic goals and pursuits of people that it is supposed to serve within the Islamic parameters. Another aspect of this next wave I would like to see is that instead of being prohibition orientation, that it should be makasid orientation, we would like to see that the system is riba free, the presence of garar is minimized, the presence of maisir is eliminated if possible, and to some extent, as far as these three things are concerned, the industry has achieved what we will identify as legalistically distinctive alternatives. However, this achievement may have been largely at the expense of substance. And that's why parallel or contemporary progress on the substance front would require accepting Makasid al-Islam, the broader objectives behind Islamic guidance and commandments as the starting point to study problems first and then devise solutions 
not just see what the conventional finance has to offer and then basically take uh, whatever they have and convert into what is Sharia compliant alternatives. Uh, that I don't think is what we should be doing. In this regard, I would also like to point out that in case you have noted that I use the term Makasid al-Islam instead of Makasid al-Sharia, but there is a reason for it that I won't go into in this presentation because it would be distracting us. But there, those who are intrigued or interested, there is a paper that uh, we wrote in 2018 in search of the Sharia that might be relevant in this regard. A related topic would be from form-oriented Sharia arbitrage to substance orientation. The issue of Sharia arbitrage has been discussed in the literature. Those of you who are familiar with the field uh, should be already aware of this. This is where participants in a captive market for Sharia board approved financial products and services are willing to pay a premium for those services. So if we have to pay anything extra for Islamic finance, it should not be just a heavenly premium that we want to go to heaven, so we have to pay extra. There should be actually a better value proposition. So substance orientation would not seek merely alternatives or substitutes of conventional products. Rather, it would identify the problems and needs of a society and based on its values and aspirations, as well as the parameters, the prohibition parameters, would seek relevant Islamic solutions. And that's why it needs to have a better value proposition that should appeal not only to the Muslims, but also the humanity in general. A related topic would be that Islamic finance should be moving away from micro juristic to more holistic. Currently, the focus is more at the contract or uh, the transaction level. And that is why uh, as we know that in our modern societies and economies, we have to deal with different kinds of risks. Some of these are unsystematic risk or a standalone risk, and some of these are market or systematic risk. Micro juristic focus or approach basically can accommodate only the unsystematic or a standalone or institution specific risk. Unfortunately, the market or systematic risk is little understood or acknowledged and particularly when it comes to inflation to business cycle, money creation to monetary policy, for example, there is hardly anything uh, substantive from the Sharia scholars and experts. We all need to work together that that gap is filled. So moving from a micro juristic to holistic approach would require uh, the relevant scholars and experts to explore, identify, recognize and address the full range of micro and macro level implications. And for that, all of us, including the Sharia scholars, uh, need to be appropriately trained and be experienced in this regard. Many of you might be familiar with a more contemporary theme that is uh, financialization. And it is basically the increasing importance of financial markets financial motives, financial institutions, and financial elites in the operation of the economy and its governing institutions. This actually also distract us from uh, the real economy orientation. And it is my hope that Islamic finance would take note of this, uh, of this tendency in the Western um, societies and economies and the delink that it has created between financialization and the real economy. And part of the relevance would be that, in fact, the real story is not in finance. Finance is actually for greasing the wheel of the economy. And it is in the production and uh, consumption in the economy that real uh, sector or the real economy unfolds. And that is why business and the real sector, we need to understand better and we need to be interfaced properly so that finance, conventional or Islamic, and our focus here is Islamic, it should be facilitating, greasing the will of business and real sector in our societies. I would like to draw your attention to a paper in this regard that uh, we wrote uh, in 2018. 
conceptualization of the real economy and Islamic finance, transformation beyond the asset link rhetoric. If you, uh, you might find some relevant ideas that how we can have better understanding of what real economy is and how we can have a better interface with Islamic finance uh, in this regard. From risk avoidance to risk sharing. As far as risk is concerned, there can be risk transfer or shifting. There can be risk avoidance, or it can be risk sharing. Generally speaking, one of the points that uh, advocates of Islamic finance make regarding conventional finance is that risk is not fairly shared in uh, Islam, sorry, in conventional finance. And there is good reason for having that observation. However, there is also another aspect of modern finance, and that is it is highly risk shifting. And that is not also properly uh, interfaced with risk sharing. But in this regard of risk sharing, our concern seems to be mostly at the transaction level. Because when it comes to more risky sectors, such as agriculture or manufacturing, it seems that Islamic finance is more preoccupied with trading. But before trading, production uh, has to take place. And real economy is more under, better understood in terms of the production side of the economy. And in this regard, uh, if we do not devote enough resources and attention to agriculture, manufacturing, and those basic sectors, then uh, we might, might be depriving ourselves of the benefit in the long run. And that is why Islamic finance needs to move from risk avoidance to risk taking, based on due diligence, of course, which should be based on fair and broad-based risk taking. And I believe that economic progress would be more participatory and sustainable because of that. And in this regard, we did some study uh, that is based in Bahrain and others can extrapolate further in other contexts, the sectoral distribution and Islamic finance comparative study of conventional and Islamic banks in Bahrain. And you can explore yourself whether this observation uh, is borne out uh, by the uh, study. Also, as part of this next wave, I would like to see that Islamic finance is, instead of being development neutral, it should be development relevant. As we all know that Islamic finance started as part of the revivalist movement in the Muslim world so that our problems can be comprehensively addressed, including the issue of underdevelopment. Uh, and all this can be addressed better and more effectively in an Islamic framework, that is our belief. However, it seems that from development side, Islamic finance is largely neutral, with micro juristic focus on forms and contracts. Uh, it is neither mapped out to enhance nor seems to adequately care about development. If it does, it cannot be merely rhetoric. It needs to be properly mapped out. and the contribution of Islamic finance and its impact must be measurable. It cannot be simply uh, generally stated that yes, it is relevant, but there must be actually benchmarks or uh, KPIs to basically assess that. Islamic finance to be truly and meaningfully Islamic cannot be development neutral. It has to be development relevant. But this is something that is going to create opportunity not just for others, but also for industries and stakeholders, as well as for the financial sector, because ultimately financial sector is also a commercial enterprise and they want to make profit and they want to prosper. But by being development relevant, there can be more balanced and meaningful prosperity. There is a recommended reading in this regard, the challenge of poverty and mapping out solutions, requisite paradigm shift from a problem solving and Islamic perspective. Again, I draw your attention to that. Uh, hopefully, you will find some uh, enlightening uh, approach or perspective in that, in that paper. Also, as a side note to development, uh, there should be a thing that being, instead of poverty neutral, we need to be poverty sensitive. Uh, and that's why it needs to have a, needs to have a better value proposition 
because ultimately in any society where there would be poverty, we have a collective responsibility and Islamic finance has to be an instrumental part of it to combating poverty so that this is eliminated or at least alleviated in a meaningful way. And uh, right now, uh, as you already know that the industry began actually as its origin uh, through the capitalization and patronization from high net worth and ultra high net worth people, uh, especially from the oil rich Gulf countries, uh, it needs to be acknowledged that whatever we do, it needs to take into consideration the aspiration of broader people, the mass, who uh, might be bypassed by what is happening in Islamic finance or how it can actually benefit them. To be substantially relevant to the Muslim world and to humanity, Islamic finance needs to be poverty sensitive and have a pro-poor orientation, which will, in my view, uh, will enhance the potential for a bigger middle class. And that is one of the keys to and a measure of modern economic development. And that has no conflict with Islamic uh, perspective either. As um, uh, poverty is reduced, uh, we don't need to be rich, but middle class should prosper and they should have uh, the solvency uh, addressed and a reasonable standard of living is maintained, that would be important. There are some additional uh, readings are recommended, including a paper, Islamic Wealth Management and the Pursuit of Positive Sum Solutions. We should not be seeking prosperity that bypasses others. We should not be seeking prosperity that is based on the notion that our prosperity must be at the expense of others. And that would be zero-sum thinking or near zero-sum thinking. I think we should be uh, ap um, adhering to or adopting a more positive sum solutions. And if we seek it, it is my humble submission that we have enough creativity and resources that we can come up with uh, positive sum solutions rather than compromising with near or zero uh, uh, sum solutions. From debt orientation to equity orientation. We all know that modern economies are based on excessive debt. Indeed, in the modern history, modern economic history, all the crises that we have come across, excessive debt has been one of the key uh, or core features. And it is not exception uh, to what has happened in 2008, the last crisis as well. Now, the crisis that we are going through now, the coronavirus crisis or induced crisis in 2020 is a different one, but excessive indebtedness has always been an issue. And it seems that our approach is that we want to solve uh, the in excessive indebtedness with more debt. I'm afraid that uh, we can just perpetuate the problem and make it worse, but it's not going to solve the underlying issue. So Islamic finance has an opportunity to promote and creatively introduce a more balanced orientation that brings more and more equity into picture. So as Islamic finance believes in a broader participation based on fair sharing of risk and return, unfortunately, it is primarily debt oriented. And most of the uh, components in its portfolio are debt creating and that's why we have a major concern in this regard. A shift toward equity orientation would mean more participatory finance and better and broader economic development. A recommended resource in this regard would be Islamic finance and the debt culture. Are we trading the conventional path? Uh, this was published in 2015. You might find something relevant in that paper to, uh, or as a food for thought. Uh, from relative inefficiency to efficiency. Uh, in this one, I don't have anything uh, significant to add, except we are becoming more efficient, but our efficiency should not be simply as a matter of matching conventional performance. We need to do fundamentally and essentially better than that in the sense that it is able to serve people better and more affordably. And I'm sure that if we put our minds together, we can move in, in that direction. 
but also dependence on the interest-based system, pricing in particular, as we have to price everything uh, linked to interest-based benchmark is a kind of another self-imposed predicament that has prevented, in my view, true innovation and deprived potential efficiency and competitive gains. Again, we need to have more research. Our mind should be devoting uh, more creatively uh, toward these topics that how we can move beyond interest-based uh, uh, dependency. On the one hand, interest is haram. We need to eliminate it. Uh, if uh, interest-based system is there, there should be a war from Allah and Prophet, but dependence on then uh, interest-based system, it actually begs a lot of questions that uh, somehow robs the credibility of the industry to a great extent. An important thing that I would like to draw attention to is that from mainly competition, we should be thinking about mainly cooperation. Quran has a very important theme that in my view has not been given due attention and that is the concept of ta'awun or cooperation. Uh, even when Islamic banking started as an industry, uh, it basically took the conventional shell or a structure. It did not take into consideration cooperative financial frameworks such as credit unions, which is based on uh, owner membership and so on, all these have been generally ignored. So when Quran says, there is a broad range of imperatives uh, and there are a lot of possibilities based on cooperation. And by the way, there is a robust literature now available that is cooperation based. It's a evolving paradigm. And from Islamic perspective, we should be familiar with it and also from the perspective of Islamic finance, we need to be creative in incorporating cooperation as the basis of our structures and processes in various enterprises. Cooperation does not eliminate or obviate competition, but there has to be a balance and cooperation needs to be at least duly emphasized or uh, incorporated. There is a recommended reading in this regard Banking Structure and the Riba Interest Equation, the case for Ta'awuni Finance or Cooperative Finance. Hopefully you will find some relevant ideas there and I look forward to your feedback in this regard. That brings us to the theme of ownership fiqh and the spreading ownership. Much of the discussion in Islamic finance, you will see as uh, legally oriented, it talks about who is the owner, who becomes the owner as part of the transaction and how the risk and other things associated with this are affected, all that are relevant and no issue with that. But we should also be talking about how to spread the ownership because one of the things that also Quran teaches us and we are finding out rather as an extreme experience that world is moving toward an unsustainable level of concentration of wealth and inequality. So this is a core concern of modern 21st century economic discourse that uh, they are focusing on inequality and concentration of wealth as uh, an underlying issue affecting all other uh, economic issues. Uh, it just happens that banking sector and the capital market, along with rent seeking behavior, especially under regulatory capture, these are particularly instrumental behind widening concentration of wealth. So first of all, Islamic finance need to be aware of it and should not fall into the trap of it. And then it should contribute toward that better equality and concentration as the Quran teaches us in Surah Al-Hashr, verse number seven, that the wealth should not be uh, making a circuit or circulation among only a few wealthy among us. Now, this is also interesting that uh, in modern time, the people who are actually becoming super rich, they are not becoming super rich because of their labor, but it is because of their capital ownership. And once they are into the cycle, it just feeds uh, onto itself and more capital ownership leads to more capital concentration and they have more capital under their control and this cycle needs to be broken. 
And that is why addressing this vital issue requires sensitivity and commitment to spreading ownership so that more and more people and institutions have ownership of assets, wealth, but particularly I'm talking about capital ownership. There are quite a few uh, recommended readings in this regard. And one of those is also uh, hoarding versus circulation of wealth. And another one is rent seeking behavior and injustice exploitation that you might also find interesting that many times our uh, focus on riba is too narrow. Uh, there are actually a lot more exploitation might be going on in the name of profit and uh, rent seeking behavior that we need to be aware of and bring into our uh, uh, focus parallel to uh, riba as a theme uh, of prohibition. Uh, it is argued that Islamic finance emphasizes profit and loss sharing, and that should continue. But we also need to think about how to add to that institutional profit sharing. The PLS, as it is understood, is basically at the transactional contractual level. Its impact on the economy and the parties involved are minimal. And that's why institutional profit sharing is fundamentally important for Islam's anti kans or accumulation stance and to spread ownership. This is not just a matter of law. This is not a legality. This is something if we take it as a value, as a principle, as a norm, then it has to be addressed accordingly. Let me offer you an example in this regard. This is a story some of you might be familiar with. Uh, there, was, uh, there is a uh, Turkish immigrant, uh, Hamdi Ulukaya, who established a Greek yogurt company, Chobani. It is now a multi-billion dollar company. And in 2016, it declared that based on the success of the company, the company will offer shares to its 2,000 full-time employees 10% of the company's future value in the event of a sale or an IPO, which essentially will overnight make many of its employees millionaires. This is institutional profit sharing. And there are already employee stock ownership plans that are there and the concept of shared prosperity in this regard is highly relevant. Again, these are not matter of law. These are matters of what do we want to be? Where do we want to go? That are unconstrained by Islamic parameters and we should be creative and dedicated uh, in this regard to move in that direction. By the way, uh, this theme of uh, this uh, institutional profit sharing other things that brings us to a resource that just published uh, in 2020. Uh, Brother Muhammad Ismail mentioned about it. It is the first book uh, to be used at the level of courses like introduction, business, introduction to business, as it is taught in many business schools. Uh, but this is for Islamic focused uh, text for Islamic business administration concepts and strategies. Many of you who might be interested in that, this is the first step uh, and we would very much like to have your feedback on the book, especially if you are going to use it. From parochialism to universalism. Remember, we talked about that uh, we are created for humanity, not for ourselves. And that's why it should be understood that whatever we choose to do and the way we do it, that we should be able to relate to the humanity. The principles of Islam that underlying, underlie the finance is universal. Fairness, ethics, transparency, sustainability. And all of these subject to specific prohibitions in Islam. But sometimes what happens is that, this is also something that one of the conferences I attended in Malaysia, and former Prime Minister uh, Mahathir Muhammad also uh, drew attention to this, that maybe this time, that we should not be just calling this Islamic finance and limiting ourselves uh, to a religious label. If it has genuine value proposition for the entire humanity, then we should be able to come up, come up with proper branding of it that is focused on its underlying value uh, for this world and for the life hereafter, but sometimes leveling could be a constraint. That is why finance based on the principles of Islam needs to focus on those universal principles 
not just on the forms and labels. Solutions guided and inspired by these principles would be more relevant and beneficial for Muslims and the humanity. Also, as we seek profit, we should be seeking ethical profit. This is where we might be able to make a distinction. If Islamic finance is properly interfaced with businesses in the Muslim world, that it also promotes ethical profit, then we might be able to offer a better alternative to the rest of the world where commercial enterprises exploit people, exploit the poor class, exploit the uh, labor class in an unacceptable way. And by uh, generating ethical profit, and there is ample room of such, uh, for such profit, we might be able to make a better contribution and it would be inshallah more pleasing to Allah. Does Islamic finance to be Islamic must embrace ethical principles and foundations as the first order of priority, which will establish its true distinction and its positive universal relevance for humanity. There is a particular reading for that. Uh, many times we think about Zulum is only in regard to riba, but uh, you might uh, find out uh, or you might already be familiar with that actually much of exploitation and Zulum in the modern time actually is more connected with profit seeking, seeking pursuit than just riba. Uh, some of this might be a little bit more provocative, but I hope you would read with an open mind and explore this. Uh, ultimately, uh, we all are here for mutual enrichment through our ideas. Uh, toward the end, uh, we should be also moving from microethics to macroethics. I will uh, share an interesting uh, anecdote. Uh, one of the central banks uh, in a, a Muslim country uh, asked uh, to prepare Islamic ethical business, uh, sorry, uh, Islamic business ethics course for bank employees, particularly those who are working in the Islamic banking side, uh, which we did prepare. And I hope that it would serve well uh, to that. But much of the unethical problems are not at the lower level, not at the practitioner's level. It's actually more at the institutional level and decision-making level. That's why macroethics is very important, which often is not discussed. I hope that you would uh, take time to uh, familiar, familiarize yourself with macroethical issues and see how the discourse about ethics can be broadened and which can enrich uh, Islamic finance and move it in the uh, desired direction in future. Remember, we talked about a specialist statistic well, there was about 19,700 people who died at that time. The statistics that I'm seeing today is about 20,309. So during this almost one hour presentation, on average, just during this period, about four to 500 people died due to hunger. Well, I personally don't know them, who they are, and most likely you don't know them either. They are not my relatives. Uh, they are not in my neighborhood, and where they are, I don't know. But as part of the humanity, as a human being, as a Muslim, I think it's a shame that anybody, a human being, a single person, should be dying in this world due to hunger. And we all have some responsibility um, and have some opportunity to do. We need to engage, find out how can we eliminate this problem, that somebody in this world does not need to die of hunger, regardless of whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims. This is something, a shame on us, on the humanity, and we should be coming together to uh, face this problem together. And regardless of which sector we are working on, or which country we are living in, or what field are we from, we all have ways to contribute. I just wanted to sensitize because as our, uh, uh, one of the Khulafa Rashidin, Omar Ibn al-Khattab who apparently said that even a dog dies of hunger during his rule, he would feel responsible. Uh, somehow we have lost that sensitivity. We need to have this back. And everything that we do, whether it is in the real sector or the financial sector, we need to come together in that direction that these challenges are addressed. That is why 
uh, academically speaking, you will come across a lot of definitions of Islamic economics. And I also teach uh, the subject, we discuss about it, but I think we need to have a more simplified approach to it. To me, an Islamic economy is not uh, defined by some legalistic perspective or parameters. Yes, there is relevance of that. But to me, an Islamic economy is an economy that embraces, upholds, and fulfills the vision of shared prosperity based on the principle of sust sustainability, both intergeneration and intrageneration, and subject to Islamic parameters such as the makasid and the prohibition. But in any society, I don't care how much legalistically uh, alternative we have come up with, if somehow we cannot have shared prosperity, uh, I have difficulty attaching Islamic label to that, but we can actually address that together and we should be moving in that direction. That brings us to the end of this presentation. And I would like to remind, I am an economist with expertise in uh, finance. Uh, I am also a social scientist. Uh, some people might be from the background of law, other might be from the background of medicine, some people from the field of accounting, some are from engineering, some are decision makers, some are principals at the schools, some are in the government, some are at the international level, but wherever we are, we should be finding ways to contribute toward certain common things. We should be emphasizing creation of employment for maximum number of people. Development and solving problem is not primarily through charity, but actually by creating legitimate basic need fulfillment opportunities. And for that, employment generation is the right way to go. Economic growth that is broad based and that represents inclusive development, poverty alleviation and elimination if possible, reduction of income inequality and concentration of wealth. And I want to particularly underscore this because it is not just inequality or concentration of wealth. It is also concentration of power. The people who have more wealth, who control the wealth and capital, they also control the policy makers. And that's what is meant by regulatory capture, that those who are supposed to regulate us, often they are captured by the very same people who are supposed to be regulated. I invite you to uh, explore these issues. All of these would require, of course, good governance. All these good ideas, sincere and pious uh, affirmations or declarations and proposals would basically would not be effective unless we have good, conscientious governance in the Muslim world and beyond. And uh, that's why Quran teaches us Walikulli wijahatun huwa muwalliha to each is a goal to which Allah turns him. We all might have individually different goals, different career, different field, but we should be striving together toward all that is good. Wheresoever, wheresoever you are, Allah will bring you together for Allah has power over all things. Uh, I archive my papers on SSRN. Most of these are there. I invite you to visit and explore these. Uh, I present these ideas. Some of these might be provocative. Some of the papers you might find provocative. But as I have made my assertion before, I don't treat this as dogma. This is the result of my lifelong learning. And I hope to learn more as part of my uh, journey on the path of learning. And I just hope that uh, some of you might read these and take these ideas, explore these, and if you find something relevant, inshallah, put it to good use so that we all can become more effective. We can all become more impact oriented. And that also goes for Islamic finance. It has already gone a great distance from where it began, but we also have a lot greater length to go. And I hope that our next web helps us to uh, traverse that longer distance, but hopefully in a more desired direction. Assalamu alaikum.